Hey everybody and welcome to another Friday evening panel for the QWE Mentorship Series. Tonight we're going to be talking about professionalism and problem solving, which I am so thrilled to be able to sit down and talk with all of these wonderful guests about. Um, we have some familiar faces here tonight, so um, I'll, we'll all go around and introduce ourselves. I'll start us off. Um, for those of you who are new to the stream, welcome. My name is Dr. Sarah Hayes. I am Queer uh, Women of Esports Mentorship Lead, and I am here to help with all things guidance around the mentorship program. I help lead our mentors and mentees through each of our cycles. So here I am, and here's this program. So welcome. Um, why don't I transition on over to uh, Kate? Sure. Um, hi, guys. I'm Kate, um, Dr. Kate McGee, a physical therapist. Um, I pronounce her she, her. Uh, I've been working in esports since 2015. I co-own a health and performance company called 1HP. We provide health and wellness services to teams, individuals, schools, organizations, uh, with an overall goal of just helping players play more and hurt less. Who's next? Who's next? My dog is next. He's got a dog. Your dog is next. Dog would very much like to introduce himself. <laughs> um, yeah, we need yeah. a dog intro first before our panelist intro. Thank you. Um, <laughs> High priority. I, I, true. Uh, <laughs> I, I'll go last in comparison to the dogs. Um, hi, y'all. Um, my name's Libby. Online, I go by Eskessian. Um, I my background's in community marketing and ma uh, community management and marketing. Wow, mm -hmm. words are hard. Mm -hmm. um, it's a Friday yeah, night. We're just like okay. with it for the intro. Oh no, we got you. Um, we got you consistently. <laughs> Uh, my background, like I said, community management and marketing. Um, I've worked in a bunch of places. I've worked at SteelSeries, I've worked on Star Citizen, and just a bunch of stuff around the gaming industry um, that I've really enjoyed. Uh, my current role that is sort of my main bag is I uh, co-founded an agency that designs marketing campaigns, um, specifically on the brand side, right? Consulting with brands when they have that board meeting that says, we need to work with gaming. And someone goes, but how? We go, hello, we're Radiance Media, and that's what we're here to teach you how to do. Um, so uh, co-founder and chief marketing officer at Radiance Media, um, do a bunch of stream stuff, manage teams, stream on my own, do a bunch of resources around charity streaming, um, and I am terminally online. And that's about all I got. <laughs> I love that. That was the best. Like, if we were in an elevator together, that would have been perfect. So I'm really proud of you. <laughs> it's, it's marketing. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. Uh, yeah, I'll finish this out with intros. Um, I'm Sibby. I also have buckets, so you might see me pop around a lot with QWE. Uh, for my job, um, my career, I am the assistant director of the esports program at the University of Michigan. Um, that has been a program for the past year and a half, and I've been at the university for three years, three plus years now. So buckling up for that cold weather. Um, don't ask me about it because I'm going to complain. But I also serve in the role as the Twitch lead for QWE. So it's a little weird being on this side of things because I'm usually behind the scenes and, and making sure that we get production all set and ready to go. So I'm really excited to be hanging out with y'all and to be on this side. Well, I am so excited and I know my dogs continue to have feelings about it because <laughs> you three are some of the most professional people I know and I am just, I'm so excited about this topic. Um, so why don't we go around and start off by talking about, um, and oh, housekeeping before you. Um, if any viewers have any questions for our panel, please go ahead and ask them. Um, clearly my dogs have questions. Uh, and so if you have them, cool. type them in the chat. We will definitely. <laughs> um, Your questions are, can we have more food mostly? <laughs> yes, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> they would love that, but no. Um, I, I, if you have questions, pop them in the chat and we're happy to answer them. Um, if you need anything outside of that or want to ask a private question, please feel free to pop over to our Discord. Um, we definitely have that community over there that's fantastic and we would love to have you. And then you can also ask us questions at any time. Um, and then if you can find me on there, uh, you can just forward it and I'll connect you to the right person. So without further ado, um, why don't we start off talking about how we understand what professionalism is? How do we define it or how did we learn about it in our careers? Cool. 
Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like I have to think about it. It was like a, it's a compound question, and clearly, uh-huh. apparently, basic sentences are difficult for me today. <laughs> um, I feel like there's this really early on concept of professionalism, at least for myself when I was in university, where you sort of get the, I guess maybe in like high school, right? But you get the concept of like, oh, well, when you have a job, there's like this standard that you have to meet. And it's that you have to be like diligent, on time to stuff, polite, helpful, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, I think it's interesting because there's like a million different societal reasons you could drill down Uh into and say like, that's Mm -hmm. kind of a sham. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I think the first instance that I remember hearing about professionalism as a young person was like, no, you can't have crazy color hair. That's not professional. Yep. Which is so funny working in gaming. Like, yeah, mom, how'd that work out? <laughs> Me and my full sleeve of tattoos have some opinions about yeah. people's thoughts on tattoos. Oh, I, I, I think we should get there because I don't want to like start this off with the banger of like the concept of professionalism is is Do it. Do yeah. it. But, <laughs> you won't. You won't. That that was definitely my first introduction. Um, I think over time, just in like work life, I've really sort of adapted it to think about. Do you get stuff done? Can people count on you? Mm. You know, and when you say, yes, I'll do that, do you actually do it? And that's sort of my bar for professionalism. Added to that, like, when you don't know something, do you admit that you don't know it? And like, seek out the help versus saying, yeah, 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 I got it. And then just be like, oh crap, how do I do that? Um, But like, yeah, I think, I think originally, right? Very sort of, oh, it's it's fitting into a box of what professionals do mm-hmm. i think for me it's adapted over time into like are you good to work with and can i is it a there's a trust building with professionalism mm-hmm. anyway stop rambling that's really interesting because kind out. of my my way of like uh kind of approaching professions early on and even still is a little different like i so I am, you can't tell because I'm sitting right now and also because of my towering and intimidating persona. Um, I'm five foot two. I'm short as heck. Um, I, I also look like I'm 12 if I don't have at least some degree of makeup on. Um, I regularly get carded at R-rated movies still. I'm 31. Um, so like, it's the worst. So for me, I recognized fairly early on that there was going to be situations where I'd want people to try to take me seriously. And so working at a YMCA in high school. Professionalism was almost like a persona I put on to get people to take me seriously and actually listen to what I was telling them. Because I knew that I was right. I knew exactly what I was doing. Um, But they didn't know that. They didn't believe that because I didn't look like their idea of professional. Um, So I always thought of professionalism as something I put on almost. Um, I think it does tie into certain character traits. But for me, a lot of the character traits that are associated with professionalism, diligence, honesty, um, trustworthiness, responsibility, honestly, those kinds of things are like, those are good person things. Um, And so it's more just, yes, I always am those things. Those are important to me for my personal morals. Um, And then the professionalism is basically the flavor of presenting it. And it's gonna look different in different contexts, right? I have what I call my my hospital PT persona, oh, um, oh. which is I wear long sleeves underneath my scrubs, so you don't see my my tattoo unless I fold my sleeves up. Because most of my patients are older and a little more conservative, mm-hmm. and so they'll take me more seriously if I'm dressed a certain way and talk a certain way. And then I come to gaming; people are going to take me far more seriously. And like my my gaming patients take me way more seriously when they see that I've got tattoos and then I swear all the fucking time. <laughs> like they they don't see professional as you know. A particularly put upon perfectly respectable persona that makes them suspicious that makes them uncomfortable so mm-hmm. i think professionalism is really context dependent hmm. i love that we're already so many layers deep into like what is professionalism and it makes me, <laughs> it makes me so happy that like we're not holding anything back um but it made me think about like when i first started my professional like career i did uh a graduate assistantship so I like went to grad school for the work that I do now and coming out of like college and going immediately into that it was like a really quick shift for me and um I know it's hard to see from behind a computer but your girl is I'm loud I like cuss all the time I am like in I'm in it I know how to be like adaptable to situations like what y'all were talking about too but that that's just who I am and I remember going to a conference and I really like just was living my life doing what I do and then uh one of my like supervisors pulled me aside and he was like hey you need to like 
tone it down a bit. And like from that point forward, I really put a hindrance on like how I show up and exist in the workplace. And as I've gotten older, <laughs> that has definitely <laughs> like worn off. Um, because like, why is that? And like, that's what we were talking about. Like all those different layers that like, I mean, we could spend decades talking about it, but I, I had to get to a point where I felt like, yes, I'm doing the work and I'm getting things done. I'm being diligent and all the things that matter in a career but also allowing myself to be okay with being the loudest person in the room as long as I'm letting other people talk or like advocating for people in the room to have their time to be loud too. Uh, so it's taken me a very, very long time to get to that point of where I don't feel so like embarrassed or ashamed of just being like who I am and not having to be in that space of like, I have to be quiet. I have to like keep my opinions to myself. Uh, yeah. If you follow me on Twitter, that is no longer the case. So hello. Hi. I'm Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> Again, like I, I still think it's really context dependent because like I, I do not bring up politics or religion at the hospital unless one of my patients raises the topic first. And even then a good deal of the time, I'm going to change the topic of the conversation, mostly because I recognize that there's a possibility I'm going to disagree with this person. Mm -hmm. I could potentially ruin our rapport by disagreeing with this person. And also, I really don't want to have a discussion about my fundamental human rights with you in the hospital when I'm trying to just help you get better from gosh darn knee surgery. Yeah. Um, I also don't bring it up when I'm working with a patient directly. That's not to say that I'm not open and kind of public about it in areas where I'm still representing myself as a professional. And I think that's one of the things that, for good or for ill, social media has allowed for pretty much all of us that we exist in this online space, that most of us are identifiable as ourselves and probably connectable to our professional identities. Um, and so I think a good deal of us are getting more comfortable with talking about what we believe and what we accept and what we don't accept on social media, which I think is helpful in the long run. Um, there's definitely, I've definitely struck a balance in how I phrase it more often than not, but I'm much more comfortable talking about it. Yeah. I feel like in psychological tutelage in our teaching in our college years, I, know I was never told what professionalism was, right. but similarly, like in high school, like you dress up and you do the thing. I feel like I learned more from my very concerning sorority years than I did from my time in education. <laughs> Um, because we had to dress up for meetings and stuff. I feel like there's a story uh, there, Sarah. There's a lot of stories there. Um, I learned good lessons and, and lessons the hard way. Um, but I, I feel like I too had one of those moments, like I, I had a half shaved head for a while, like more aggressively than your usual person when that was more in and I covered it up. I made sure it was underneath my colic so that if I wanted to cover it up when I was working as a clinician, for those of you who are unaware, I'm a, I'm a um, psychologist. Um, I would cover it up. And then one day I was like messing with it because it was doing something or whatever. It, it's weird. And then when you grow it out, it's weird too. But I was messing with it and my supervisor saw it and she's like, why do you cover that up? Hmm. And I was like, well, it's unprofessional, isn't it? And she's like, why? You're a person. You're talking to people. And that just like unlocked my mind of like, I'm just a person working with people. <laughs> but there's still things like diligence and emailing back and like communication, honesty, loyalty. But that was something where like professionalism started in my understanding as a, an impression you make. And then it continued through with like the person you are rather than being about the person you are in fancy your clothes. Mm -hmm. But yeah i am um, i have that a lot because my my other thing that isn't gaming is i coach high school robotics um and i am always hyper aware of like with my streaming i do charity streaming and sometimes i'll say like oh i'll do a wild hair color for charity so um i finished out uh a school year and i did saint jude play live in may and one of the things was i'll dye my hair chat picks right like the donors pick and they picked blue and purple and I went to the salon and I'd never done wild hair before. I love it. I would go back to it in a heartbeat if it weren't so like overwhelmingly effort, not effortless, it's so much effortful. Your girl would have pink and orange and everything. <laughs> but I remember the first day I had to go back to the school and it's still the school year. 
I just coach after school. I'm not like in the classroom all day. Um, and I'm like hiding my hair. I have it in like a ponytail. I've got like a team hat on. Like, yeah, it's still blue coming out of the hat, but like I'm pretending that you can't see it. Right. Mm. Um, and the kids go, that's so cool. And I go, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. And I had in my head the whole time, just like you, Sarah, like, oh, that's not professional. My assistant principal comes by, she walks into the room, she goes, that looks rad, I love it. And then she twists her hair back and she's got the school colors yes. as an underlay <laughs> in the back of her hair. Yes. And I'm like, all right, girl. <laughs> like, it's so funny because I, I think I was, at the time I was a, a much, a, not much younger, it was five years ago, but still that means I was 25 instead of 30. Like yeah. I was a younger mentor and I'm thinking, well, all these teachers are like real professionals. Meanwhile, now I teach during the day as well. Um, I have a teacher who comes in in Green Bay Packers sweatpants because he's just like super jazzed about it. Um, and, like, and that's it's spirit day, so it's fine. Um, like, who cares? Um, we're all just and I think it's really cemented. We're not kids. Mm-hmm. Well, I, for me, it's really cemented the idea that like, as long as we're still being good role models, like. It's the same argument of the tattoos and the colored hair in the workplace. What's stopping me from getting my job done? You're just a person interacting Mm -hmm. with people. What does that choice kind of like change about my ability to teach or counsel or, you know, any of those things? It it doesn't. Right. And I think, I think that's like a a rabbit hole of professionalism that is specifically (laughs) around appearances and all that kind of stuff, but it's, it's fascinating. Um, I'm very much like Kate in that I am 5'3 and also look like I'm 12 if I don't put makeup on. And I work in a school and it goes, where's your hall pass? I work here. Where's your hall pass? I work here. Like I have to like hold my ID up and be like, teacher keys, teacher keys. I'm not a child. Like, oh, it's no. a lot. So I identify very strongly with the idea that like I need to dress and act and like be authoritative in a certain way to like take up more space, usually height-based space, mm. um, but just like more space so that I'm taken seriously. Um, and that I think that's, there's so many rabbit holes from that, but it's, I completely understand it. And I love that perspective of, I'm just a person interacting with people. Like, yeah. Yeah. as long as I'm and still I really good like at that. I really want to give that caveat too, that like, you know, especially with, with what Libby and I are talking about, with you know, wanting to take up more space, look older or more professional, like that's, still within a fairly like quote unquote easy construct as we're presenting as the gender that you know we were assigned at birth um it's, mm-hmm. it's fairly easy to, to look at us and assume female uh, which i am it's an easy assumption to make and it's the correct one in my particular case um but for anybody who's dealing with any kind of visual presentation that differs from what people are immediately perceiving them as what they want people to perceive them as it's just so much more complexity to determine how am I best a professional? Um, and there's no reason whatsoever that someone who is assigned male at birth and who is female, um, who doesn't, you know, quote unquote, pass. Um, there's no reason that their appearance has any impact on their capacity to do their job well. There's no reason that their appearance, uh, their their appearance does not negate their identity. And yet, because we're all so kind of ingrained with very particular ideas about what it means to be a professional. So particularly what it means to be a professional looking woman or professional looking man. Uh, there's just so much more work and so much more difficulty that folks who don't have what I have have to deal with. Mm-hmm. Nothing but snaps for that. 100%. Truly. Truly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm just sitting here. Yeah, like, I don't, yes. yeah. Like I, I really want to give that caveat without like talking over like the experiences of folks who have dealt with that because I don't want to speak to a thing that I can't. Yeah. Well, and I think everybody has caveats with that too. Like I've had this, the opposite problem. I've been five, seven and had a body since I was in seventh grade. So I, people assume I'm older than, well, now they probably would estimate my age about where I'm at, but mm-hmm. it's been a thing. And, and when I worked, they, uh, I worked at a used car dealership in reception when I was in high school and they called me jailbait because I would dress professionally and like business casual. And I would have these, yeah. <laughs> We know where this is going, right? I had these customers come in, hitting on me, asking me on dates. And my boss is like, yeah, can you wear heels next time? And I was like, can you, can you, can you not, can you not show up ever again in my life? Can you tell me where this place is? I'm sure it's not for any kind of nefarious or criminal purposes at all whatsoever. (laughs) I don't know. Yeah, to my other job that I'm getting after I quit this one. Absolutely not. What the hell? Get me out of here. 
16 at the time. I did I did Disney cross stitches, and when they're like, "What's your major?" I'm like, "College prep." Yeah, <laughs> just to like make myself look younger. AP, like, get out of my face. <laughs> I'm trying exactly. to finish something Elsa here. Elsa What's the professional response to that? Mm. Which it's like, ugh, that was probably one of the worst experiences I had when it came to like expectations of professionalism. And it was keyed into that, like gender presentation and like expectations for women mm. or me as a, as a, as a, well, I was a minor, I was a, a girl, yeah. but like what we expect from people. And that was one of the harder ones I've had to go through. Um, I think another thing, like, we're just going to keep snowballing. I feel like we're not even going to get to our schedule. Let's questions. do it. Let's we're just commit to the care. snowball. On we're going to commit to the snowball. Uh, we're still talking about professionalism. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I'm professional. <laughs> <laughs> I we're hearing that and like some of the things that y'all talked about earlier about how, um, like how expensive it is to show up and be professional, how that differs, for, like based on like your gender identity and like how you show up and who you are. So like, Y'all talked about, like, I have to wear some makeup so I don't be, like, I'm not, like, 12 years old or, like, people don't ask for my hall pass. And, like, I don't wear makeup, but I think that shit is expensive. I don't know. I think it is. Yeah, y'all are nodding your head. It, okay. okay. It depends. <laughs> but, like, that's a, that's another barrier that, like, we don't see across the board. And then, like, clothes. Like, wear heels. I know that you didn't do that, Sarah, and I love you for that. But like if that's an, that's another and I wear them all the time anyway. I mean whatever. Yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. I mean, now you wear them because you want to, not because some creepy old dude told you yeah, yeah, you should yeah. to get more sales. But like how you know, how many yeah. different barriers are there of like just financial, just thinking financial of like you have to wear makeup or people are gonna ask if you're tired or like if you are like supposed to be working here and like how that interacts and impacts your experience and like what you wear as far as like clothing. Like I worked with a guy he had two pairs of khakis and then five different polos that he wore. So like he had a Monday polo, Tuesday polo. I knew when trash day was because of the polo that he was wearing. <laughs> and I was like, honestly, I, that sounds blissful. Isn't that nice? I would love to do that. Oh my gosh. So like, I've absolutely adopted that in some capacity, but I think about people that like it, you know what I mean? Like you're not supposed to wear the same thing all the time. You know what I mean? Like, ah, I don't know. I just like, there's well, so many different layers of like how expensive it is to show up as like fin yeah. presenting or like a woman or wh whatever the case may be, whatever layer. Or even if you're, even if your workplace just has a very particular like uniform requirement, there's mm. still a financial cost associated with that regardless. Yes. Yep. And some places subsidize it. And sometimes depending on what it is, you might be able to get tax right up for it. Scrubs, right. it turns out, can't be worn literally anywhere else but a hospital. I mean, they can, but they're you're required at a hospital, so I get a tax write-off on them. Hmm. But, like, <laughs> that's not a thing everywhere. You right. know, a place that requires you to, you know, let's say you work at a nice restaurant. You are required to wear a white button-down, black slash, black shoes. Um, yes, you can shop at thrift stores. Yes, you can shop at relatively inexpensive places. But you're still required to wear a very particular outfit. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on your body type, that may or may not be all that easy to find the stuff for. Also, nobody sells white button downs anymore, except like Brooks Brooks Brothers. And I don't know why. Yes. So yes. mad about <laughs> it. <laughs> Someone's looked into this. Uh, but I mean, Sarah, yeah. something you were talking about too, There's there are very particular expectations around making a professional response to something somebody says to you that is utterly unprofessional hmm. um, and utterly just out of line, disregarding the professional aspect of things. And yet then the onus is placed on the person who's supposed to be the professional um, to respond not in kind, but to like either, you know, politely refute or to politely set aside or to like gloss over or ignore. Um, and I really hate that particular aspect of professionalism that the professional thing to do is let it slide because they're the customer hmm. uh, because i think that's a terribly horrible way to actually retain employees and treat people who are working with other people yeah i feel like that's <clears throat> i feel like that's um a really difficult hurdle especially when it comes to feelings of safety at the workplace too. Like as, okay, so you work in more of like a medical setting. I work more in, in a, like pseudo, like clinical, although now we're all in my office. 
<laughs> oh, this is not therapy. <laughs> Nothing that is shared on this panel is either medical or clinical advice, and we are not your therapist. Um, but I, I would learn in school about where to put your chair in case a client loses it on you. Mm. And you, you do that. And you have, like, I had a taser in my office at one point when I was doing testing because there were some clients who came in. I used to work CPS cases, and I would have to try to professionally, like, be kind and patient with this person doing the testing while their boyfriend is trying to bash down this door where I'm doing testing because they're controlling and abusive and they don't know what's happening on the other side. Like literally that happened. We almost got kicked out of our building because it was bad. And I had to like, just kind of be okay with that and receive calls from the other businesses being like, what's going on and stop it. And I have to profusely apologize, even though I didn't ask for any of that. I just wanted to hand over some surveys and go home and cuddle my dog. But here I sat. So I think that that's important too of like, whether it's compliments or commentary on how you look or um, everything from verbal abuse from clients and from customers to different situations between coworkers and strange dynamics that it's so hard to know what to do when, what do we know as the professional thing? Mm -hmm. Ugh, ugh. Yeah. The older I've gotten and the more confident in myself I've gotten, the more comfortable I've been with not letting something slide and not just like doing the, the kind of socialized nervous laughter thing. Yep. But just very politely, flatly, non-confrontationally saying, that's not appropriate. Please don't say that again. Mm -hmm. And usually the response is, is good. The response is, oh, I'm sorry, or what happened? Or like, they'll do the awkward nervous laughter thing. It's like, good, you should feel awkward. Mm -hmm. Um but that's that's a thing you have to practice. That's not a thing that comes easily or naturally necessarily, especially not when you're trying to conceive of what professionalism is or looks like. Um, and so when you finally reach that point in your career where you do feel comfortable doing so, yeah, sure, absolutely. That should be the, the, the professional thing to do. And you should be professionally supported by your professional colleagues and also shutting down that kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. And it sucks when you're the only one who's doing it uh, rather than kind of having that whole network behind you. Mm -hmm. Can I make a suggestion around when someone says something inappropriate? If you yes. don't want to do the like, that's not appropriate, don't keep going. Um, if it's like someone making a joke, oh, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Make that that is that is <laughs> because when, when people make like, for example, like the joke they think is funny, but is actually like super racist. It's like, I'm sorry, I don't understand. And like, oh, well, you know, it's funny because, and then you have to watch them explain. Ooh. Like, it's funny because I hold such and such prejudice and yeah. think that this joke is appropriate to tell. I'm like, oh, yeah, no, sorry, I don't get that. It's it's great. It's fantastic. Uh, you have to make sure that your tone like, is right for it. Like, you have, your tone has to be, like, genuine tone of, I don't understand. Yeah, like, sorry, what? I'm not following. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that. I One, one time that <laughs> has great. happened. Yeah. One time that has happened to me, I, I like it registered and I was like, that is so far off base that like, I don't even know how to confront this. And instead of like approaching it in that exact time, I like set them, sent them a message later on. I was like, Hey, like, I just wanted to let you know, like during this conversation, you said this and it made me feel, um, X, Y, Z. And I like, if, there's time for us to talk about it. Let me know. And like, they actually showed up to talk about it more. And I was like, wow, we actually got somewhere. I realized that that is not the case every time, but sometimes I think it catches you so off guard because you're in that one frame of mind or like in that space or at work. And it's so completely off base that right. it takes you a minute, you know? And I think that's, that's okay too. Like, I, I think it's okay. Like, I love that. Absolutely. Like, tell me, wait, what? I don't get the joke. I love that. I can't wait to use that. It's great to have to stop at your thoughts in the moment, but you don't always, and right. you know, that whole Le Frida Scalier, you don't always have the answer till you're, you know, in the shower later, repeating the argument to yourself, as yeah. we all inevitably do in showers. Right. Um, but yeah, no, the follow-up later, totally fine way to go. Yeah. If you think it's going to be, you know, if you think it's going to go over well, if you think it's safe for you to do so, that right. kind of thing. Yeah, totally agree. We had a quick question from chat. Um, you're not going to like my answer, Exorcist. You're not going to like uh, my answer. <laughs> Exorcist. Uh, the question is, how did you manage to avoid student loans when going for your respective doctorates in awesomeness? Um, I didn't. 
I am several thousand dollars in debt. Hmm. Nay, may I say over one hundred thousand dollars in debt? I will be paying these off That's for the rest several. of my life. That's hmm. several. Uh, I, I, same answer. I did not avoid. Uh, I, I, I've recently gotten myself down under the hundred ten thousand mark. Yay! Um, but like, this is great. But on the well, one I'm hand, done. like. I have I started at a at one hundred and fifty two thousand. Right. I have paid over eighty six thousand dollars in you have. student loan repayment. You have. I have gotten it down from one hundred and fifty two to just under one hundred and ten. Yeah, the in interest is ludicrous. It's awful. Weird. <sighs> yeah, <laughs> for real. The off topic to suggest that the student loan system is a complete scam. Do anyway, it. let's talk about professionalism. No. <laughs> <laughs> May I professionally okay. suggest the student loan system is terrible? Do we want to tie it into professionalism and problem solving? Because part of it is how do you get through school without ripping your hair out or going completely gray mm. while still attending your <laughs> classes and paying $1,200 a credit? Because that's what I paid. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I mean, so, so some of it, I mean, if we're going that route, some of it is recognizing that a lot of actually this this does work so i went to the university of delaware the university of delaware is an absolutely fantastic school for physical therapy it's actually number one in the country it's tied with usc and i have a long-standing personal rivalry with usc and could not tolerate going there <laughs> that's a story for another time um but i went to ud and ud was an out-of-state college for me okay. so i paid out-of-state tuition um it is the best it is the best school in the country for pt and i wanted that reputation behind me Thing that I learned after coming out of PT school and working in PT for several years, there are plenty of really fantastic, not actually number one, but still really great PT programs within the state that I was born. I could have gone to any one of those schools and paid less than I did. Um, a lot less? No. At least some amount less? Yes. Um, and that, when you're starting out, definitely makes a difference. But that's also the kind of thing that you really can't know until you're already out in the workforce, right. or unless somebody who's already out in the workforce tells you this. Um, that the college ranking system is also at least to some extent a scam and is weighted very heavily based on the amount of research that your institution performs, which is governed by two things, really, how much funding your institution tends to get and how much freedom your professors actually have to do research as opposed to spend lots of time teaching students in classes. Um, so don't throw all the weight behind just the ranking that they're given on the U.S. News and World Report ratings. Uh, and instead, look for the quality of the school. Talk to people in your chosen field and ask their opinions of particular schools, um, which should let you have a little bit more variation in the decision you make as opposed to just prescribing yourself to a lifetime of very large student loans. Yeah. Would you say you suggest perhaps a mentorship program? Oh, Sorry, couldn't resist it. Why, well, yes. Somebody experienced in your field who's able to tell you about the things that you wouldn't otherwise know until you've gotten there? That sounds great, like a mentorship program. <laughs> It's almost like we have one of those. <laughs> almost like we're doing it for just that reason. <laughs> and I feel like I want to transition this a little bit too to the games industry, which I feel like is so pertinent too, because then you really want to talk about whether or not my institution mattered. Like, mm. <sighs> right. <laughs> yeah, right. In a lot of cases, it's what institution, it's experiential learning for so much of the gaming industry. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Yes. And for those of you interested in our mentorship program, if you are unaware or for our mentees who are currently in and have eventual interest in continuation or participation in other roles, we open our um, advertising for the next cycle for mentor applications in December. So next coming month, up. it's coming up. You should join us. You should. Coming up. Mentees get to apply end of December, January. So keep your eyes peeled on our socials for that information. Um, we accept mentees and mentors who are interested in or seasoned in the games industry and um, want to thrive in competitive gaming or beyond. So here we sit. Um, but I also think about like, okay, all of these things we're thinking about in the games industry too, mm -hmm. it's such a microcosm and anything you say on social media, anything you say anywhere, like forever. fans, community members, colleagues, everybody sees it. And yet Twitter is like the games industry. Yeah, it is. Truly. Yeah. Oh. Like, Libby, you mentioned being term terminally online, but like we all are going to have to be working in the gaming industry yeah. and working in esports. If you're not on Twitter on a fairly regular basis, possibly an unhealthily regular basis, you're missing a lot of what's going on. Yep. You're late. 
Yeah. Oh my gosh. I, I right think I spent chat. like last weekend I spent two days off Twitter and I came back and I was like, hello? Like what is <laughs> what I've it's missed been everything. Four years, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. Everything you put on the internet, even if you think you can delete it, it doesn't get deleted. Delete Let's it. be serious. It, it, yeah. Somebody screenshotted that. Some it's somewhere. I'm, I'm thinking in particular right now, uh, last year's um, uh, Me Too movement in games and, and in esports, um, hit Dota in particular. Dota is the game that I started out in. There was a player who was credibly and accurately accused of a number of things, and he posted an apology. And and I'm grinning as I, as I talk about this because the apology was so laughably and hilariously terrible that I checked on the way back to team. It had been archived 83 times in the first hour because people knew it was going to get deleted and wanted to be able to go back to the switch. And when I say it's terrible, I mean the guy was accused of sexually assaulting someone. Um, and uh, part of his defense included, uh, it takes more than the wink of an eye and some cheap small talk to erect my penis. That is a verbatim quote from it. <laughs> oh, no. What? How to be unprofessional. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Example A. In your apology. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. So anyway, yes, if you're apologizing for something, don't go that particular route. But my point was really more about how everything on the internet exists forever, especially if it is in any way, shape, or form either memeable mm -hmm. or something that people can hold against you because you are a type of person that they don't like. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's not necessarily about being professional. It's sometimes it's yeah. about protecting yourself. Yeah. yeah. Well, what was that, Libby? I was gonna say I had that happen when I was in a community management role. Is um, I was streaming on my own personal channel, doing my thing. Yeah. And yeah. I very frequently talk with my community about my role in community management, and I talked about a frustration I was having with the particular community I was managing. Um, it was a like mobile game played by basically middle school boys. So I was just talking about like, yeah, it's it's t I'm having a tough time keeping my boundaries because it's absolutely toxic, right? Like. I'm having people like follow my socials, which is normally fine in a community management role, but then like spend all their time aggressively harassing me on my socials. I have, you know, folks who come by stream and all the clips of these moments where I'm just talking personally as Libby about my own struggles with the role I have. And every 10 seconds I'm saying, I love my job. I love what I do. It's great. But here's something I'm struggling with because someone was kind of asking me like, what about getting into community management? Um, and I said, watch out. This stream got clipped up into four and a half hours of analysis by a particular community member about how I didn't deserve my job because I complained like twice. And it was a four and a half hour documentary series in which they wrote out how I didn't deserve to be a community manager. I clearly don't even have, you know, any knowledge of gaming, all this stuff. Because for 20 seconds, I was like, man, this really sucks. I'm really tired of people saying we found your address, here it is, and posting it in the game's Discord, right? Like, yeah, I'm allowed to be pissed off about that. And when that um, smarmy little child showed up in my chat, I was like, hey, you're not welcome in my personal space. Yeah, Sorry, out. Buckets, get the fuck out. Yeah. Um, like, and I said it on my stream and he goes, Everybody look, she's so unprofessional. And I'm like, bro, no. you showed up, <laughs> mm -mm. you showed up <laughs> on my lawn and yeah. said, you coffee wrong at work today and I said please get out of my house like you're in my home my online home go away talk to me at work fine talk to me at work I don't care but get out of my house and he's like see she's so unprofessional and I'm like mm -mm. it was a four hour I, I mm -mm. have so many rants about it but it literally was like this four hour series because I said two teeny little things on my stream and it spurred this person into like a vendetta about how I must be terrible at my job so like Yes, what you say online lives forever. Yeah. Yes. Libby, and I was as... sorry. I have a follow up. Do it. Yeah. I was yeah. just going to point out tis, as Tissa said, you have the right to remain silent. Truly. And he's absolutely right. Yeah. Truly. Libby, I like had a similar, not like to that extent, but like to a point where people were like, Sibby's not, she's not fit to do this job. Like, she can't do this. Like, she, I was called a boomer at some point, I think. So, like, that's, what I've, you know, have encountered at some point. How do you, going through all of that, what you went through, 
did that have like an impact on you? Like, did you take a step back and think like, well, maybe they are onto something. And if you did, how did you navigate it? And if you didn't, like, how did, how do you go through that? How do you rise above all of that? I think for that particular moment, I totally admitted like, yeah, I let that get to me a little too much. And I was not, I didn't behave the way I should have on stream. Normally Mm -hmm. I'm like a let it, you know, silently ban, let it roll kind of gal. Um, in that moment, um, this person had already been like harassing me for months and I'd mm-hmm. already like, my company had contacted the university that he went to and was like, hey, you, this child goes to your school and is using school resources this to child. harass our staff. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, it was, you know, it was like a 19 year old kid. And like, I get having poor judgment at 19, maybe not that poor judgment, but I, I get it, right? Yeah. Um, I think in that moment, I had times where I was like, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to like be the face of something this popular to people so that they get so passionate? But I've I've been in a role like that my entire life. Um, I got into community management by accident because um, I've been involved in competition robotics. I talked about that a little bit um, since I was a kid, but also my family founded the league nice. that all these teams compete in. So since I was 15, I would be going to these competitions and people were like assuming I was a public face. So I learned how to message to crowds very early on by making a lot of mistakes, honestly, right? Like by being a 15 year old kid and posting something on my like MySpace that people took as, you know, oh, the nice wrong news. thing. Um, I know. So- Sorry, so oh, I love Zanga. I learned to code because of Zanga. Oh, 100%. Um, so we all did. Uh, <laughs> we all did. Well, I needed to make sure that all of the colors on it were absolutely perfect. I needed to know my HTML. Good. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. yes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like I, I had moments where I was like, this is stressful. Yeah. Um, I still think at the time I was like, well, okay, next time maybe don't like go off on a random kid on your stream Mm, (laughs) right like like, that was not a great choice i made um i didn't nothing i said was a lie right Mm. i said i don't want you in my house but i could have you know maybe not given it as much power as it it took Mm -hmm. um but in the same vein like the criticisms that were being made of like what i was doing there were some communication things of like oh she said this and like then the patch notes didn't come out for another day and it's like okay well the part of that was in my that was in my control. I could have handled differently. The part where nobody handed me patch notes for three days, not really my fault. Um, yeah, <laughs> you know, right. um, I think I learned a lot in that role about like, hey, if you even vaguely promise something, like a one percent, like yeah, we hope to have it by Friday. Gospel Friday, truth. like do it. You suck at your job. <laughs> um, but I, I also like questioned myself a lot and was like. Oh, maybe I am really bad at this. Like maybe I'm terrible. And it kind of took the the gems in that community to be like, hey, we really appreciate you. Like for every one, you know, snarky little kid, there was 20 people going, like, hey, thank you for putting this together. We really appreciate it. And that sort of scale helped me not get in my own head about it. Yeah. Um, but there were definitely things I sort of like looked at critically and I said, okay, well, they're expressing this criticism to me the wrong way. Mm-hmm. And they're saying I like don't deserve to work in the industry. But could I have messaged this differently? Could I have changed that? And I tried as best as I could to like, what's the thing in Parks and Rec where she's like, you know, all these people at the town council they're, meeting really care about their community. They're caring so loudly the at me. Like they're <laughs> aggressively caring in my direction, right? Like what yes. what gems can I pick out of the aggressively caring? Mm-hmm. Um, and some of them were not necessary criticisms at all. And some of them totally were. And I think those I got to kind of pocket and hold on to. Yeah. Um, and then smack down the harassment as best I could. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really fantastic example of professionalism, like to have yes. the self-awareness to recognize, mm-hmm. you know, even mm-hmm. though this person is entirely out of line in how they're addressing me and their concerns, I'm still going to take the time to pick through it, see if there's anything valid that I can learn from and do better in the future. Like that's, that's the height of professionalism to be able to set aside the emotional yeah. aspect of it. Uh, should you have to? No, in an ideal world, people would actually communicate well with you as well and, and not be, you know, absolute assets about it in the process. Yeah. But it's a credit to your professionalism that you could do that. Yeah. It makes me think about, as a clinician, I always can't help but say, like, whenever we get into these conversations and we talk about, like, people who've done harm or people who've experienced harm, if you receive criticism from somebody, 
our internal reaction, our emotional and cognitive reaction is defensiveness because we imagine ourselves as good people who live by our morals and values. Now that's our internal experience of ourselves, but when someone tells us something that we've done, say that I said something that was unintentionally racist, um, my initial reaction is, well, I'm, but I'm not. Mm. Yeah. Well, but what I said caused harm. So I challenge everyone always, and it's a perpetual project, it's especially a perpetual project for um, those of us who have um, power dynamics involved in our jobs, which most of us do, um, but especially those of us in positions of power, if somebody brings something to you, especially in a quiet voice, but generally, listen to it, swallow it, take a minute to process, and, and ask yourself, how can I improve? Just like what Louis was showing, where it's like, we have to do that because that's how we get better. That's how we grow as people. And whether or not it's at work, that's just being a professional at humaning. Mm. Like that's being a good quality human. Ugh. Humaning. I like that that's come up several times, right? Of like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's what we call professionalism. We really just think about like being a good person. Right. I think that's really, there's, there's a really interesting kind of fold into like general ethics there as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. A big part of being professional is just being visibly a good person. I think also too, like Libby, when you were talking about your story of you had that one person, but you had 20 people that came to like bat for you. I think another part of professionalism and just being a good human, <laughs> a humaning is like when people are doing good work or you appreciate them or they have impacted you in some way to tell them like they're there's nothing that stops you. I, I I do that typically like really late when I'm just like thinking about people and I'll message them randomly. Like Sarah's been part of this at some point. And I'm like, Sarah, I just really <laughs> appreciate the work that you do. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I, I just, I think that's so important too. Like we, we, we can be leaders and we can be uh, these huge advocates, but also like letting other people know how they impact us and how they have helped us in that journey or like just living day to day because honestly existing is challenging sometimes so i think those things are also really crucial in in everybody's success and to play a part into professionalism is highlighting the people that have been a part of your journey in some way so i, I love that that's happened for you Libby, and especially with that time and i mean really like pragmatically speaking like a really great way to to get people to behave more professionally like visibly good people is just positive reinforcement of good behavior, right? It's, yeah. you know, it's uh, most of the time when you're on the phone with uh, somebody on a, you know, on a, like a call center, uh, most of the time you're only gonna ask to talk to their manager if they did a really lousy job. Mm -hmm. um, if they did a good job and you ask to talk to their manager and say, you know, I wanna tell your manager how good a job you did, you're reinforcing the good job that they did. You're reinforcing the professional behaviors they engaged in, which makes them that much more likely to do it for somebody else. The same thing goes for literally all of us. We all love positive reinforcement. So when people are doing the right thing consistently, a really great way to kind of reinforce that level of professionalism throughout our whole community is just letting people know like, hey, I see you doing a great job and I want you to know it's seen. Yeah. I love all of this. And my brain is torn as far as like, we're this, this time is flying by because I think there's so much here and I want to be sure, I don't know, what do y'all want to cover more? Should we cover like one big tip or like your major advice for people and for our mentees on like if they're facing an issue or if they're how to handle things professionally mm -hmm. um, and or like what's the biggest thing that has made an influence in your career that has helped you feel more professional and more skilled as, as humaning goes. That was a big convoluted if question. I go that was, there were many questions. Huh? So I, I think I actually have an answer for that. A big thing that really helps me with being more comfortable being myself and recognizing that that was still professional um, was this whole last year. Um, and for, for reference, at the time I was working in outpatient orthopedics primarily, as well as doing my, my stuff with 1HP, um, I was at one point functionally running three clinics entirely on my own, driving between those various clinics, utterly burnt out, 
um, and utterly giving absolutely zero fucks as to whether or not I was coming across professionally because, damn it, I was holding these clinics together and that was going to be good enough. Um, and the thing that I realized in the process of feeling all of that burnout and processing thereafter was that it's not so much about it's not so much about like actually being perfect. It's it's more about being comfortable and confident in the knowledge that you do have, recognizing that you do in fact have value. And it's a lot easier to not take that stuff personally, to not like be quite so worried about how people are going to react or respond when you've at least somewhat decoupled your identity from your work. Um, that's not to say I don't love what I do, because I do. Um, and that's not to say that what I do doesn't form some part of my identity because it does. Being a physical therapist is a big part of who I am, but it's not all of who I am. And if I entirely tie my identity to the work that I do, that I'm going to take any criticism, worry about professionalism so much more, those criticisms are going to feel personal attacks on my identity, which is going to make it that much harder for me to grow and be comfortable um, saying what is true or accurate or right. Um, so to whatever extent you can, recognizing that you are more than the work that you are doing, um, I think really allows you to, when you are doing the work, be more professional about it. Hmm. To tag on to that too, because that's something I struggle with all the time. Um, you're like, oh yeah, decouple yourself from work. I'm like, I'm sorry. I don't, I'm sorry. I don't understand. Um, <laughs> but um, I, that's something I've been working on a lot. But um, with that, um doing things because they are right in alignment with your work, whatever, rather than to convince somebody else that you are valuable in that work. Um, I had that a lot. I had a conversation with a couple of creators for a project I'm working on and it quite literally was, yeah, no, I'm, I'm done doing extra work to convince somebody else mm. that I belong here. Mm. Right. And that is mentally the biggest hurdle of like, no, but I want everybody else to like me and like think that I'm, you know, good at what I do or whatever. But I think a component of decoupling that from the work that you do is sort of like having that and whether it's reassurance from a mentor, from, you know, your support system, whatever, to have that component of like, no, I am good at this mm -hmm. and I'm not going to beg you to validate me. I'm going to say, here's what I can do. And if you are asking me to to validate, okay, maybe that's not in alignment, right? But I'm not going to sit here and go like, please, I'm good at what I do. I'm good at marketing. <laughs> I'm just doing my work. And that is what shows that I'm good at it. I, what I, like when I first was like thinking about this topic and like talking about it, I know that these are two areas that I haven't been great at. And so like, with Sarah coming to ask me this, I was like, wait, there's no way that she thinks <laughs> that I'm professional and that I know how to problem solve. But I, it took some time to like reflect back on my past experiences and like how I have shown up for myself in problem solving and like being professional when it matters. But I, I think like the biggest piece of that and what I would always stress to somebody that's entering the field, what whatever field, whatever chapter of your life, is what like a lot we've been doing tonight is hearing from people and their different experiences and their strategies and knowing like when to ask for help and not being like embarrassed by that or ashamed by that and I I have really valued that education of learning from others and uh the biggest thing with like problem solving in my opinion is usually like if there is a problem it's because like a mistake was made and if the mistake was your mistake it's like the first step is owning it like I had a really big uh mishap with something a week ago and the first thing that I did in the email that I sent out was hey I made a huge mistake and I realized that these are the impacts for everybody I am so sorry like that was the first thing that I said is just acknowledging that and I think that makes you human for like your your stakeholders or the people that you're serving is like I made I messed up like I really messed up and this is what happened I can only imagine this is how it impacted these are the things that I can do about it but this is how I'm going to make it better in the future or like steps that I'm going to take to uh, to minimize the risk of this happening in the future so I 
I think with problem solving, I know we haven't really talked too much about that um, tonight, but the, the biggest piece of advice is to, you know, utilize your resources. So if you have a network of people or you admire somebody that does problem solving really well, asking them their advice, but knowing that it's going to come down to you and like how you uniquely problem solve whatever that certain situation is, or you're going to take things with you for every every mistake that you make because you're going to make mistakes and that's okay. And it's, I think it says some things about you with the mistake that you make, but I think it says more about how you bounce back or how you fix the mistakes or how you um, make people feel. And I think, yeah, all of that like circles back to like humaning, <laughs> like Sarah, you bringing that up. It's just showing that you're human and acknowledging what has happened I think a lot of that goes into just problem solving in general and it really helps you out with finding a resolution I think people trust you more that way too right because absolutely there, if you were like this unattain unattainable bastion of, of perfection and professionalism you're like that's too good to be true I can't trust them ultimately you're just super intimidated by them mm -hmm. but when you see somebody make a mistake and then their response is you know to acknowledge what they didn't know to acknowledge what they did to, you know, show what they're doing to do it better. You know, the real experts are the ones who are willing to say, I don't know, but I'm going to find out. And yeah. um, I think the real professionals are the people who are willing to say, I made a mistake and I'm going to do everything I can to fix it. Right. Absolutely. Well, and I think I love the boundaries chat that's happening. Um, mm. yes. chat, I, that is absolutely an aspect of professionality and professionalism that is so hard. Um, and I think I would be remiss without saying this, especially in our community, especially with our mission at QWE, that if something that somebody's saying or doing irks you or makes you feel uncomfortable, or if you don't feel seen because someone's treating you or seeing you a particular way, A, it is 100% okay to check in with a colleague or a trusted person within the organization or even your superior, if that's someone who's comfortable to you. Um, and B, you don't have to just sit on it, trust your gut and pay attention to it because there's been so many times I think we could all probably reflect, but I'll speak for myself that there's been times in my career where I thought that I was going with the professional choice of like rolling with things mm -hmm. and um, going along with what other people were doing because I thought maybe I don't understand it or maybe, you know, um, maybe they just don't understand what I'm trying to say or how I'm conducting myself in the world. But really, I think that you deserve respect as much as you are you are working hard to respect other people. You deserve that professionalism right back to you. So don't take anything laying down. Yeah. <laughs> and at the same time, try your best to be a good human about how you do that. And I feel like um, while mentees, we can, we can follow back, circle back into the problem solving conversation, certainly on Monday night's workshop. Um, I think that a lot of problem solving revolves around the concepts we've been discussing tonight, like honesty and integrity yep. and communication. Um, but don't let anybody shut you down if, if you're trying to be those things and, and they don't take you seriously. Make sure that you get the respect you need. So where can everybody find you all Oh, before we wrap? Oh, I mean. Yeah, go follow Twitter. Oh my gosh, you got it right. Wow. <laughs> oh, look at that. Look at that. Time. To do it's, it. it's like somebody is a Twitch, <laughs> a Twitch lead here, you know? Being uh, prepared is another aspect of professionalism <laughs> that I respect you for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, for me, anyway, I'll let yeah, everybody chime in. Um, Twitter's great if you like want some real good stuff. Um, but I've learned to like connect people on like LinkedIn, so. Uh, there will be a time where I post about my LinkedIn and I'm able to connect you to somebody that I know. Um, so that's another area too, but yeah. Kate, how can people find you? Uh, they can find me quite easily on Twitter. I'm Kate McGee PT on there. Uh, and Kate is spelled C-A-I-T. I know there's 20 different ways to spell it. Um, you can also find uh, a lot of the work that I do at one-hp.org or on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash one HP org. It looks like one H porg. I've been some Star Wars movies. This delights me every time I see it. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn, much like to be. Cool. Yeah. Um, I where am I where am I findable? I said hello in the chat. Um, I do I do Twitch things um, under Escassians here. Welcome to hang out with me anytime. Um, 
But primarily, I am, like I said, terminally online. I'm always on Twitter. It's Libby K. Um, and Libby Kamen on LinkedIn is also totally fine. If nice. you found any value in something I had to say and you want to chat about it, feel free to hit me up. I'm also in the QW Discord, so you can always find me there. Yo. I'll look there. That's it. So, well, thank you all so much for being here tonight. We are so grateful for your input and your wisdom and your experiences that you've shared. Um, and mentees, we will see you on Monday night at the follow-up workshop. Um, and if you're time traveling and watching this and following up, thanks for watching. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, <laughs> and remember that next month we will not be having our typical um, panel for mentorship on a Friday externally because internally we will be working towards our capstone project uh, presentation which are happening soon. And if you want to know what is a capstone project and why are they doing that thing, check out our website at queeresports.org. You'll see about the mentorship program and everything that that is containing. Um, otherwise, we will see you all on the interweb soon. So thanks for being here and uh, thanks for being part of it. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye, y'all.